Uh, certainly my goal this afternoon, as Bob and I discussed, is try to sum it up. Um, that is a challenge. Uh, cell lifetime productivity is not something that we can easily get through in half a day and go back and think we have all of the answers. I think clearly from our demonstrations today, you've, you've been able to see that it will take a period of years. It will be a systematic process that you will go back with your clients and uh, within your own systems and start to take apart the areas that you think are key to changing uh, your performance. So certainly, as we've talked about, the world population is growing and our resources are limited. And so we have to continue as an industry to find ways to become more efficient and more productive with what we have available. Certainly, as the industry is starting to contract in response to feed prices and pork prices, uh, we have to, to manage what we have better. And one of those areas is, of course, sow productivity. As defined this year by the National Pork Board in their initiative, uh, they are defining sow lifetime productivity as the number of quality pigs a sow produces in her lifetime. And the National Pork Board's goal in that initiative is to increase productivity by 30% in the next seven years. So some of the research that you saw this afternoon that's starting to go on is part of this effort of finding ways to improve that productivity in our systems. So I'm going to go through a little bit with what each of the speakers talked about try to highlight those, add in a few things that um, I've thought about as I've gone through the task of defining cell lifetime productivity. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about nutrition later on because nutritionists can't meet a group of vets without telling you a little bit about nutrition. Um, but hopefully by the time we get done today, you'll, you'll go away with a good appreciation. Uh, Dr. Pullman did a great job this afternoon outlining the critical areas to evaluate to help define the opportunities for your system. Certainly, uh, Smithfield has a process that they're going through to look at those economics and understand where those opportunities really lie. Uh, as he identified, and this is work that we, I pulled from Lucia, but as he identified, reproduction is the key area that we're looking at for culling. Uh, low productivity, I actually consider part of the reproductive failure as well. And then we do have some lameness and structure issues that we need to address in order to maintain our herds in production for longer periods of time. So one of the tasks that Dr. Sunberg, or one of the items that Dr. Sunberg addressed in the Feedstuffs article, noted that if we're able in the US to increase all of our herds by one additional litter in, a, in her lifetime, it can increase the pork industry's net value by $250 million. That's a significant number that we're looking at. And I think Steve did a very nice job of demonstrating some of the value that that lies in with just their system alone in Smithfield. This is work that Juan Carlos was willing and, uh, and kind enough to share with me. Uh, the numbers are a little bit different. This was data demonstrated in 2010, but uh, on a relative basis, it's all still there. Today, we certainly know our replacement guilt cost is going to be higher than 200. But as we look at the total revenue, as that sow increases her lifetime productivity from 45 weaned pigs up to even 55, so an additional litter there, uh, we can see that her relative margin over genetic costs is going to increase by about $400, which we would expect. So I think it's very clear as a group, we all understand more pigs produced, more value on the sow. But how does that play when we look at the net margin on our herds? So in this demonstration, and this is also courtesy of Juan Carlos, we can see here in those parity or in those females that are only producing about 10 and a half weaned pigs. At some point, when we look at, at the cumulative cost of feed, housing, labor, and that female cost, we may never come to a point where she is profitable in our system today. And so as we drive those numbers higher and we look at ways to maximize the number of pigs that a sow is able to produce, then we start to move those sow uh, producers into an area of profitability. And certainly as our feed cost is rising, which it is today, um, we are going to have to be looking closer at 11 pigs per wean to even break zero. So from Dr. Pullman, we went to Dr. Flowers. 
And Billy did a very nice job discussing the physiological test for cell longevity. He spent a lot of time talking to us about the value of weight gain and birth weight on overall performance. We certainly understand that cell lifetime productivity is not a one-step process, but rather it's an integral part of many different areas of that cell's uh, experience. So anything from age of breeding to the number of offspring, and pre wean mortality, wean to estrus, all of these things are very key in what's ultimately going to happen with her productivity level. One of the things that um, I spent some time looking at on cell lifetime productivity was actually human literature. And I understand that pigs aren't humans and humans aren't pigs, but at the same time, we have a lot of information that we can gain by looking at some of the human literature there. If you have a chance, I would pull up this article. This is Gluckman et al. It is a 2005 article, and he goes through and summarizes a large series of human literature that's out there. And it talks about the roles of maternal environment on offspring performance. Now, certainly, he addresses some papers that are out there that talk about the famine in Hungary. Uh, we also know uh, the concentration camps during the Nazi uh, period all talk about nutritional deficiency. And that doesn't just happen for one generation, but that happens for two generations. And so if we're looking at our multiplication herd, and she's carrying a group of pigs, and something happens to her so that she's not nutritionally in a positive state, we may not only be affecting that offspring that she's producing, but that offspring that's going to our commercial farm to develop that terminal pig, that terminal pig can also now be affected. So we may have a slower growing, smaller statured pig. So this information, I would encourage you to take some time to think about and challenge yourself on how we're treating that maternal female and where does it really begin? Because it doesn't begin at birth and it doesn't begin at weaning it can actually start way back in utero. Uh, Venice et al. also has a nice study in 2000 that demonstrates that in humans, girls that are being born that are defined as small for their gestational age actually have a series of reproductive consequences for the rest of their life. They actually found that they have a higher FSH level, and it indicates that they have an ovarian hyporesponsiveness. And through ultrasound, they're able to determine those young ladies also have smaller uteri and that they have a reduced ovarian volume. And so they track these young ladies all the way through puberty. So here again, some very interesting literature that starts talking about that, as we've talked about, the two-pound pig that's being born and why she's no longer, why she's not the ideal candidate for our replacement stock. Uh, we have human literature that gives us some very good indications that that would be true. Dr. Ross and Cassidy did a very good job today talking to us about sow productivity and how it doesn't start at the time of breeding, just like we were talking about with the human literature, but rather it starts very early in the lifetime of that female. We all know when that litter is small, we have a wide variety of activities that are going on that can influence how that animal performs in the lifetime. Now, if this was a multiplication litter, I think Dr. Flowers would be very upset with me because that's certainly not seven pigs. But um, it's there to demonstrate a point. We can create very um, well-balanced females that are highly productive, but we have to understand the consequences of having a high number of pigs on a sow at a given time, particularly if we're looking at multiplication. So we know that there is a large amount of literature um, that is out there that demonstrates that even over the last 10 years, that selection and production methods need to start at an early age before that gilt's first bred. And certainly today, uh, Dr. Cassidy's and Ross help us understand that. As Dr. Uh, Cassidy is discussing, not only are they looking at the parameters of birth weight and lifetime performance, but they're also doing a subset that's looking at spacing and housing and how that can affect, affect that animal's uh, ability to be maintained in a herd for longer periods of time. So as I mentioned, I'm not going to let you get out of the room without a little bit of nutrition. Um, but when I think about nutrition, 
what is the ultimate goal of the nutritionist on a sow herd? It's there to increase the number of pigs weaned by the parity and to improve sow retention. Some of the production data that we focus on or have focused on in the last three years has been the fact of breeding weight. And clearly, we can demonstrate over time um, that when we get to the larger animals at breeding time as a first guilt, we can increase the number of animals that are being culled for locomotion. And I think that data is very well understood at this time. However, one of the things that we've been looking at as well is the impact of how fast these animals are getting to that desired weight. And what role does that rate of gain have on lifetime productivity? We certainly know that an animal that is very slow growing is going to be a less productive female. But what about that animal that's on the other end? Is she equally as valuable as the middle group, or is she going to be called earlier for other reasons as well? And that's some of the work that we're looking at now and trying to further understand in our own group. Uh, Williams et al. in 2005 demonstrated very clearly that the influence of weight here again on total pigs produced in the first three parodies uh, can be influential. An earlier question today was about the role of lactation on reproduction. And this is a data set that we compiled uh, over a period of time on our sow herd. And this is just looking at one lactation period, uh, nothing extravagant, but just taking a group of sows and saying, OK, if she ate four and a half, she's going over here. If she ate in this category, she's going to fall in there. And we can see as feed intake improves and increases, uh, total born will increase with it. And I think these are some things that are very simple that we can do in our systems. And they're things we talk about on a daily basis. But how many of us have the data to support it? We also see that weaned estrus declines, which is what we want. Recruit decreases the number of non-productive days that our sows are sitting there and should improve her lifetime productivity numbers. Um, this data set was from Dr. Foxcroft. And what I want to, to draw your attention to is embryo survivability. So in this situation, a control group is allowed to add libidum feed, and the tested group is uh, different restriction periods. And so he pulled on data sets from other groups and when feed restriction occurred in lactation. And the main trend here is as we suppress the sow's ability to consume feed in a manner that's supportive to both her growth and the piglets during lactation, we reduce her future embryo survivability on her next parity. And so when we start looking at reasons for calling, and our number one reason for calling is reproduction, we can see here that we have some significant opportunities to go into our system and look at the immediate, to try to start to make changes while we address how to raise that guilt to be more productive later in life. One other area, when we think about longevity, is, of course, lameness and as we talked about, to production. We know over time, as a sow ages, the number of pigs she's um, farrowing declines. Dr. Mahan put some very nice work together. This is from Peters and Mahan in 2008 that demonstrates that as a sow ages, her body stores of some of the essential minerals uh, declines. So our zinc and our manganese, particularly, are, true, are two that are declining over time. We know that zinc and manganese are involved in some of the cascades that occur during reproduction. And so what's the impact of changing the, the tissue status here in these parodies? So they did a nice study where they looked at adding organic trace minerals instead of the conventional inorganic trace minerals. In organic trace minerals, we tend to have a higher amount of uh, mineral present in the tissue compared to an inorganic. And so our stores are a little bit higher. And what you can see here, if we look at the two organic trace minerals compared to the two inorganic trace minerals, there starts to be a numerical change in the number of pigs that that animal can produce just by changing the mineral source that she's consuming. We worked with Novus International 
uh, for about three years looking at an organic mineral study versus inorganic mineral study. We had two sow farms, two 6,000 sow farms that were about three miles apart, uh, all sourced from the same multiplication herd. They received their multiple, or I'm sorry, they received the replacement gilts every two weeks apart. And we did this for three years. And we fed one farm the organic trace minerals from the time they came in at 21 days of age. And the other group never received organic trace minerals. And what you can see as we follow the cohorts through, through their lifetime, we were able to increase retention rates all the way through our parity fours when we put organic trace minerals in the diet. And, that's, and that number is, of course, significant. And it starts clear back here in our, what we call the parity two. So that's getting to the second parity. In addition, we saw what happened in Mahan's study, where we also increased the number of total born and, of course, the number of pigs weaned in that same period. One of the, I put this slide in. Um, one of the studies that is out there uh, on the boards today is a study looking at housing. So we've talked a little bit about nutrition. and We certainly understand that housing can affect longevity. And I, it's not that trying to sell a big message, but I really want the group to understand that when we talk about longevity, we have to understand that housing may change where those goals are going to be set. The reason why this slide is up here is when we start going into pen gestation, our incidence of lameness increases. And if lameness is our second reason for calling, we now have to understand that our parity structure, or our average parity, might be a little bit less on those pen gestation um, herds because they can't maintain the number of animals because of increased calling because of their housing environment. So in conclusion, we certainly need to understand that improving sow lifetime productivity is a complex goal, and it requires all facets of pork production. It's not just genetics, it's not just nutrition, it's not just health, but rather it's all the phases and putting it together into a systematic approach that addresses each area at various points, both before and during a sow's reproductive career, that helps her maximize her true capability and performance opportunities. I would once again like to thank the speakers for taking the time today to be a part of our program. Uh, Dr. Pullman, Flowers, Ross, and Cassidy, we do appreciate your time and your insight.